or the matriarch in order to make sure that obedience mm. reigns. Mm. You know, everything is the, the, the young child, uh, the young boy, the young, although uh, the general who is in power in Somalia were to speak to me, he would never condescend mm. to speaking to me. Mm. He would like to speak to my father mm. Mm. or someone of his own generation mm. in the family as my clan. Mm. Naturally, my views on uh, clannishness, my views on tribalism, my views on the family uh, are becoming more and more clearer mm. as I write, as I explore. This is a Tannenberg reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder player that uh, was made in Norway in the late 1960s. Um, they were distributed all over the world. Uh, this particular machine was used in uh, a university for language learning. Um, that's where I found it after it had been thrown out. But for me, this object represents the beginning of an electronic read-write culture which I mean, by that I mean that it is both possible for people to uh, consume media and also produce it in the home with these devices, uh, similar to the typewriter that, that started a new culture also with production of media. And I think also it's interesting that the earliest was computers were tape computers. They, they had tape memory inside them. So this device comes from that crossover point between a very sort of uh, unidirectional, much more unidirectional, because in order to operate typewriter, you had to have the programming yourself, you had to be literate. Uh, to this, with this device, anybody who could make a sound, anyone who could speak, could publish, in a sense. Uh, and it's also very easy to um, consume with a tape player. People could produce something in their home, record uh, some sound or music and share it with their friends and this sort of thing, or preserve it. Also to preserve the stories of people in the family and things like that, and pass it on after people have died and things like that. And the reel-to-reel -reel tape player is also capable of containing a lot of information. You can get up to 20 hours on a tape, um, which was a lot of, a lot of knowledge. And I'm, I'm very curious about the way that these sorts of devices were used in the community and also for their use in artistic production. I know that there were people who started using tapes in the 1950s uh, for, for sound art and music production, non-naturalistic, non non-realistic sound production where tapes were reversed, tapes were cut up, speeches were cut up and things like that in order to bring some sort of abstraction into audio production, which I think is a very significant moment in uh, Western culture. Of an interview with Nuruddin Farah, who is a Somalian writer, uh, quite famous today, but I think when this recording was made, I think it was in the mid-80s when he was in Sweden, mid-1980s. Uh, then he was in exile, he couldn't return to Somalia, and he wasn't as well known as he is today. The interview is quite long, and I think it's a significant document. And they're being used by authority. Is that a fictional uh, yes. idea or is it a tr true? Well, tr most, I mean, Sweet and Sour Milk is based on a true story. Mm -hmm. uh, naturally, for reasons of uh, narrative technique, for reasons of also support for uh, misrepresenting mm -hmm. the person, mm -hmm. the character, etc., etc. But everything in that story is true. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in fact, uh, almost all the documents that I quote, uh, the revised version of Ian Lewis's book, Modern History of Somalia, which has all the people. Well, country. I love it. Yeah. Yes. It's very good. My well, the government. The country. Well, you see, there has always been. Uh, I am no politician, I'm a writer. and. Uh,